morning everybody and thank you for joining us in today's webinar. My name's Lynn Smith and I'm the Senior Community Education Officer with the RTA. In collaboration with the Body Corporate and Community Management Commissioner's Office today, our topic is about tenancies in body corporates and also the services that the Commissioner's Office provides. I appreciate your time is valuable and this session should run for approximately 30 minutes. In today's session you will be able to submit questions so if you look on the bottom of your screen you will be able to type some questions in there and press send. Um, we will answer as many questions as we can during the session and also at the end um, if it's relating obviously to today's topic which is the body corporate side of things. So today's topics we're going to look at the body corporate bylaws in a tenancy. Uh, issues that happen in a tenancy that are in relation to the um, common properties and body corporate. Uh, we're going to meet the Commissioner. We have an interview with the Commissioner to play. Um, we're also going to talk about the Body Corporate and Community Management Act 97 and the regulations. The Body Corporate Services, uh, including their Dispute Resolution Service and Adjudication Service. And also to where to go to get more information. As I said, we will look at doing questions um, throughout the session as well as at the very end. So with us today we have our guest speaker which is Christine Partridge from the Office of the Commissioner for the Body Corporate and Community Management. That is such a mouthful. So welcome today Christine. Thank you Lynn. So when it comes time to have it in your tenancy agreement, you should actually have um, body corporate bylaws, uh, particularly if it's in a unit or a building or a townhouse complex that have bylaws that's um, attached to them. So in the general tenancy agreement, if there are bylaws, on item 16 of page 2 of your general tenancy agreement, you'll need to complete this. It's really important to make sure that you do have the correct bylaws relating to this particular scheme and that the tenant is given a copy of those bylaws. So maybe for managers, make sure that they have a talk to the owner of the um, unit or the townhouse to get that copy of those bylaws at the start. The types of bylaws will mainly include things like on your common areas, um, whether pets are allowed, behaviour of guests that come onto the property and also the appearance of lots on the property as well. As you can see, in clause 22 of your general tenancy agreement, the tenant must comply with the bylaws and this is where it also talks about that the tenant is given a copy of any body corporate bylaws. So the types of issues that we see in unit complexes um, seem to involve um, most of the following that we have up on the screen. So pets, whether the pets are allowed in the unit complex, um, some complexes do allow pets and that might be a certain size, type or weight, whereas some of the other complexes will say that the bylaws will be no pets at all. It's really important to ensure that as a manager or the owner of the unit that you're aware of what your bylaws state for that complex before you are accepting any application from a tenant with a pet. Um, parties or loud music, loud noise, um, this would also fall into your tenancy laws where the tenant agrees not to interfere with the reasonable peace and comfort and privacy of your neighbours. Um, but also too part of the bylaws would also have um, about the behaviour of guests and, and that they bring into the complex. Parking, sometimes this is also an issue, particularly if um, an occupier or a tenant has a second vehicle and there's only one vehicle space allocated to the tenancy. So it's really making sure that at the commencement of that tenancy or your management that you're aware of what the parking availability is for the occupant at the time. Again, some of your bylaws will actually look at the rules about the use of balconies and that could be like things like hanging clothes over the balcony rails or using um, like barbecues and things like that on the balconies as well. Um, maintenance issues, this sometimes do, does come up as well and this could be things like in your common areas such as your stairwell lights, um, your security gates, lifts, common areas that's used such as your pools and your gyms in the um, bigger complexes. So again it's really important up front to understand um, how maintenance is also re uh, recorded at the start of your tenancy and also keep in mind one thing that we're aware of is under the Body Corporate Act there's a requirement for details of a tenant to be forwarded to the body corporate or their manager 
if the tenancy agreement is in place for six months or longer. Okay, so just to show you some of those parts in your tenancy agreement. So this is the tenant's use of the property and as you'll see in item 2, um, 2C, interfere with the reasonable peace, comfort or privacy of a neighbour of a tenant and also D as well, or allowing, a or allowing another person to do that. And this is your part in relation to about pets. So on your page where it's got item 17.1, whether pets are approved or not, and this is again part of your general tenancy agreement. So we have a, an interview that we have with um, Mr Chris Irons. Chris is the um, Body Corporate Commissioner um, for Queensland. So we're just going to um, play that um, video. Oh, so we're going to play the um, interview for you now. So just bear with us. On behalf of the RTA, I'd like to welcome today's guest speaker, Chris Irons, the Commissioner from the Body Corporate and Community Management for Queensland. Welcome today, Chris. Thanks for having me, Lynn. So Chris, tell me about your office. So my office provides information and dispute resolution services for Queensland's community title sector. We have about uh, 45,000 community title schemes in Queensland. That's about 430,000 individual lots comprising apartments, villas, service departments, holiday letting and commercial lots. As I say, we provide information and dispute resolution services. Our information service is provided largely by our callback uh, service over the phone and we also provide information in writing. We also provide a number of online products and we maintain a website which we are constantly updating for everyone's use. One of our new developments is an online inquiry form, so rather than you having to email us with a lot of information and you not being sure about what the information is, our new online inquiry form will actually prompt you to fill in bits of information so that we can give you a better answer. Our, our, our website is www.qld.gov.au forward slash body corporate. Chris, tell me about your adjudication and your conciliation process at your office. Well, I guess it's fair to say that when people live in a community title scheme, they're living close to each other, but it's also they're living in their home. So inevitably, when things go awry, a dispute may arise. So our office exists to try and resolve those disputes, and we try and focus on resolving them as early as possible and with as little interference and as little involvement as we can. So that's why there's an obligation on people to try and resolve things themselves in the first instance. When that doesn't happen and they come to our office, we provide conciliation and adjudication. Conciliation is going to be the first step in pretty much most of our disputes and it's a particularly good way of resolving uh, some common disputes around what we would call bylaw matters such as issues about pets, noise, parking, also maintenance issues. As I say, it will be more or less a mandatory first step in the vast majority of situations. Adjudication, as the name suggests, is a bit more of a formal step. It's done on written submissions and it results in a legally binding order which can then be enforced and appealed through the courts and tribunals processes. There are approved forms and fees for both of those and our website has a lot of information, not just the application itself or the fees, but information about how to complete the application, what sort of documents you need to provide, and how the process will work. We're here to help, so we would always recommend that if there is a dispute, contact our information service, that's what it's there for, to try and assist and indeed mitigate against those disputes on 1800 060 119 or to the website www.qld.gov.au forward slash body corporate. I'd like to hand over to Christine because this is all about the Body Corporate and Community Management Act of 97. Um, so over to you Christine to talk about your particular act that you um, govern. Thanks Lynn. So firstly I'd like to start with what a body corporate is. So a body corporate is a legal entity which is created when land is subdivided and registered under the Land Title Act to establish a community title scheme. All the owners in the scheme are automatically members of the body corporate when they buy their lot. So community title schemes in Queensland are governed by the Body Corporate and Community Management Act and five regulation modules. 
These are the Standard Module Regulation, Accommodation Module, Commercial Module, Small Schemes Module, which applies for six lots or less, and the Specified Two Lot Schemes Module. Owners and all public can obtain a copy of the Community Management Statement from the Titles Registry. It's a public document and is a document that records all the details for each scheme, including the bylaws. If a body corporate does not have a CMS, then it's likely not to fall under the Body Corporate and Community Management Act or the regulations. One of these examples might be the South Bank Corporation Act. Uh, schemes in South Bank fall under that legislation rather than body corporate legislation. So the Act and regulations outline the roles and responsibilities of the body corporate as well as owners and occupiers. Great. So Christine, we've, you've got some stats here to share with us in relation to the number of schemes that um, Queensland has, so over to you again. That's right. Most customers find this interesting to see the increase from year to year. Um, so as you can see from the slide, as of March 2006, there was over 45,000 schemes in Queensland um, and that equates up to over 431,000 lots. Uh, there is a list there of how many schemes per module. Uh, the Two lot scheme module is the lowest, however it only came in in 2011, so that's a fairly large uptake since then. Right. So these are divided again by the top six local authorities, by the number of schemes. As you would expect, Gold Coast is the top with the highest number of schemes in Queensland and Toowoomba being number six. And then again by a number of lots according to the local authorities. So this has altered the order. Brisbane City uh, exists of over 138,000 lots in total and Logan City is now number six at over 14,000 lots. Um, you can see that Brisbane tops the list and that can be because they have more lots in the actual uh, rather than schemes. So they've got bigger lots but smaller, um, less schemes. Okay, great. Thanks, Christine. So in relation to the body corporate, so what actually is a body corporate and more the point, what do they actually do? So as I said earlier, it's the legal entity consisting all owners in, this, in the scheme, so each owner becomes a member of the body corporate automatically. They then elect a committee who administer the common property and the body corporate assets for the benefit of all owners and occupiers. The body corporate is required to comply with the laws when doing so um, and they can actually make decisions at both meetings, committee and general meetings. So a community title scheme must consist of two or more lots and common property. Right. Further duties of the body corporate consist of maintaining common property on behalf of all owners and occupiers and making and enforcing bylaws. A body corporate makes decisions either through its committee or at a general meeting. Each body corporate must maintain records that include things like meeting minutes and records of its decisions, financial records and authorisations. Any interested person can obtain copies of those records. A body corporate may also engage a body corporate manager, however that's not compulsory in Queensland. So for a bit more on bylaws, um, the body corporate has an obligation under the legislation to enforce its bylaws. It does this by issuing what the legislation refers to as a contravention notice. Now this must be sent directly to the person who is allegedly contravening the bylaw. So if this is the occupier of the lot, it's sent to the occupier and a copy to the owner. The notice must identify the bylaw which is being contravened how the owner is contravening it and give time for the person to remedy the contravention. If necessary, a body corporate can organise entry to the premises and that must be given to the occupant of the unit, whether owner or occupier, and seven days notice must be given unless it's an emergency. Now Lynn, I'll get you to talk about the tenancy termination if those breaches continue. Yeah. 
I find it really interesting because um, it's really clear that the body corporate cannot evict a tenant, that they do have to follow the Residential Tenancies and Room Accommodation Act 2008 rules in relation to ending a tenancy. So as much as obviously the convention um, contravention notices can be issued, um, realistically to if a tenant um, does breach the um, those notices or in relation to breaching the general tenancy, then it is following the Residential Tenancies Act in relation to issuing a notice to remedy breach, which is a Form 11, giving them a minimum seven days notice to rectify the problem, and then should that not be rectified, there's a process in relation to issuing the notice to leave. Um, so look, we might as well pause here just for a moment, Christine, if that's okay. We've got some questions coming through, quite a few questions, that's so fine. thank you for um, lodging them through. Um, Christine, one of the questions is, um, what about the approval process for pets in, complex, so, in complexes? So what would be the process and how long would that take to get approval? Okay, that's a common question we get. Um, the critical aspect is to re review the bylaw in the first instance to find out if permission is required and if pets are, are considered in that scheme. Um, if, that, if permission is necessary, then the person wanting the pet will need to make a written request to the body corporate and they'll need to make a decision at a meeting. Unfortunately, there's no time frame on that in the legislation and it would be suggested that the person asking for the pet dictate what they need from the body corporate, as in how long they have to obtain approval. Okay, so in relation to the con okay, so the word contravention notices, is that a one way? So I'm going to assume that is that that the body corporate can issue that to an occupier or a, uh, or a tenant. Um, can an occupier or a tenant issue that contravention notice back to the body corporate? No, um, the body corporate is the legal entity in which um, governs its own bylaws and enforces its own bylaws. So they relate to individuals. So a body corporate is the is the entity that enforces the bylaws against those individuals. Okay. One of the questions just coming through um, is going to talk about is asking also a bit more about the pet side of it. So I think we're actually talking about um, the question is about more about changing the bylaws to allow pets, but we're going to talk about the changing process. So yes, we'll leave we that will. one, um, yeah. Christine. Um, you, one of the other questions that's come up in relation to um, someone just wants clarification, if possible, about in Queensland, it's not compulsory to use a body corporate manager that people right. can actually manage themselves? That's right. The legislation set up for self-management. It's optional to engage a body corporate manager. Right. So that's a decision at a general meeting. Okay, fantastic. Well, we might just keep moving on. We will come back to some more questions. So thank you very much for um, lodging them through. So this is where we are going to be talking about the changes um, to the bylaws. So I can imagine this can be a, a lengthy process, Christine, but I could be wrong. Um, but if you could maybe just briefly explain how a bylaw can be amended or changed and who makes the suggestion or who makes the changes. Okay, so what needs to happen for a bylaw to alter is a general meeting decision by special resolution to amend the community management statement to add, amend or remove a bylaw that's currently in existence. Uh, this, as I said, general meeting, so it needs to go to an annual general meeting or an extraordinary general meeting. The owners can submit their own motions. O occupiers can't submit their own motions, but by all means they can make recommendations to the committee um, and the committee can also submit motions for consideration at the general meeting. Uh, there are restrictions on what a bylaw can do. So, um, it, for example, it can't restrict the type of residential use um, and it can't be oppressive and unreasonable, unreasonable. Once that general meeting decision has been made, then the body corporate must register the new community management statement within three months at the titles registry. Okay, so there's invalid bylaws as well. So what would be an example, Christine, of someone wanting to change one of the bylaws and, and it would it'd be one of those invalid ones? An example could be where it discriminates between the type of occupier. So it might uh, try to restrict the pool use only to owners, as an example. Okay, great. All right, we're just going to, again, thanks so much for the questions still coming through. There's a lot that we will try and... Um, get through as much as we possibly can. 
But Christine, back over to you again. Chris mentioned earlier in the interview about what the office does. So I'll get you to summarise again, maybe talk a little bit more about the dispute and the adjudication process. Um, sure. So over to you. Okay, so the office has two legislative obligations. One is to provide the information service and the other is to provide a dispute resolution service. Now the information service provides information to all members of the public and we do so either via phone or in writing. Um, to assist the public we also provide forms including contravention notice, dispute resolution forms and even forms to update details with the body corporate. Other ways we provide information and education is through our website and seminars as well as a free online training course and as Chris mentioned we now have an online inquiry form. We do provide forms for dispute resolution um, and I'll talk about that process a bit later. Excellent. So here we go, dispute resolution. So I just want to just be very clear that this is not the RTA's dispute resolution process um, under the tenancy laws. This is the Body Corporate and Community Management Commissioner's Office Dispute Service. So again, back over to you Christine to tell us about the um, dispute service that you offer. Okay, so it provides uh, dispute resolution which consists of conciliation and adjudication to owners, occupiers and the body corporate and a couple of other entities involved in the body corporate. Uh, now this is a low cost jurisdiction so there's a small application fee that must be lodged in accordance in, with the application form itself. There is a legislative requirement for each applicant to have attempted self-resolution with the other party prior to lodging the application. If this isn't happened, uh, the Commissioner may reject the application. Okay, great. So I would assume that you um, get quite a few disputes during the year, do you Christine? Yes, we do. We, um, we get approximately 1,200 a year, um, which is not huge compared to what RTA might see. Um, so uh, the stats as of the end of May so far this year we've received um, 593 adjudication and 505 conciliation. Okay, great. So going back over to you saying that um, self-resolution obviously the first step and yes. then what happens? Then they're required to attempt conciliation. It's a mandatory first step. Um, the applicant must complete the form in full and identify both the applicants and the respondents details as well as the secretary and body corporate managers details if they have one. There is a requirement to outline what those attempts at self-resolution were and provide evidence as well as give a background to the dispute. It's a less formal process uh, where the conciliator facilitates a discussion with an aim to resolve the dispute at hand. It's a good real agreement that's not enforceable um, and it cannot be, anything said or done in conciliation cannot be used in another dispute process such as adjudication or through the courts. So a conciliator must remain impartial and they don't act for either side. So they're there to help facilitate a discussion and provide information to help those parties reach that agreement. Um, and is the conciliation mainly done over the phone, Christine, or...? It depends on the location of parties. Majority will be done by teleconference. Um, some do happen face-to-face. -face. Okay, great. So then obviously then if something's still not resolved, we then have the adjudication process. That's right. Follows. This is the more formal process. Again, it requires the application of a form, which is the Form 15, and it must be completed in full. So everything that was previously submitted with a conciliation application cannot be considered by an adjudicator. It must be resubmitted with this form and the form must be in full. So again, applicant's name, name of scheme, respondent, body corporate manager's details, your self-resolution, a copy of your conciliation certificate, as well as the grounds as to why you should get the audio seek. Okay. And this process, um, we note on the screen, it's actually done on papers. So what yes. does that mean, Christine? It means it's all on, pro on papers and there's no hearings as such. So you don't get together with an adjudicator like you would in a court with a judge. Uh, it's all done on paper. Everything the applicant wants the adjudicator to consider must be submitted with their form as they need to make their own case. The order is issued um, by an adjudicator at the end of the process and that is enforceable and appealable. 
So your website has a lot of information and, and it's great that it's actually been divided up into titles and, or sections and things like that. So I'll get you to um, step through some of the things that you have on your website, Christine. Okay, so our website is uh, collated into topics. So um, as you can see from the screen, uh, there are topics like roles of, and responsibilities, meetings and bylaws. Um, so before you start searching the web page, it's good to know exactly what you want to find out. Whether you want to know how to make a bylaw, then head to the bylaw section. If you want to know about spending, then you'd head to financial management. Okay. And also to your new online inquiry. Yes, yeah, so this came in in April. Um, so we've had a great uptake since then. Um, it is, again, another way to get general information. We don't provide legal advice, directions or rulings and we cannot interpret the laws for you. So the regulation module is necessary in order for us to give specific relevant information and then you'll find drop down boxes. Again, it asks by topic. So if you want to know who's responsible to maintain something, then select maintenance and we will prompt you with some questions to get the relevant info. Great. Okay, so all your information is available on the um, website. Um, so again, the website qld.gov.au forward slash body corporate. Um, you've got a 1800 number um, as well. Interesting, the training assessment tool. Um, what is that for? Or more the point, who could actually access that? So that's a free service that we provide. Now it was targeted towards committee members, but any member of the public can access it. They register online and they complete the units that are available. At the end, they'll get a certificate of completion. So that's there for anybody to use. So anyone in the general public, yes. so no matter whether you're a committee member no. or an occupier, anybody no. could actually do anyone that. Anyone can use it, that's right. All right. Um, we have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to get to the question side. Um, one of the questions coming in, Christine, if you wouldn't mind, um, putting up a for rent sign or for sale signs on common areas such as your fences and walls in the unit complexes, do you need the body corporate permission first? Okay, so again, this is something that is generally covered in the bylaws for the scheme, but any change to common areas will require permission. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter whether you're adding or removing something, permission is always necessary uh, for common areas from the committee. Okay, um, how do you get a unit owner and the body corporate to adhere to the bylaws when they don't do anything? So I'm not sure what that might mean, and I'd maybe just clarify maybe the contravention notice process, maybe that might be if there's a time frame for that. Okay, so if a person identifies a contravention of a bylaw, then they issue a Form 1 to the committee. Uh, the committee then have 14 days to advise the complainant whether or not they're going to enforce that bylaw based on the evidence given by the complainant. Uh, if they're not satisfied, then it's up to the complainant to either pursue it through our office or deal with it through uh, with the actual alleged offender. If the body corporate do enforce the bylaws, then uh, again, they must send the notice, the contravention notice to the offender and pursue it either through conciliation or the magistrate's court. Okay, one of the questions come in in relation to um, with the dispute side of things, do you go through the adjudication or the QCAT, are they the same? No. I think it's probably, mm -hmm. yeah, just clarifying, if it's a tenancy dispute situation, yep. You go through it, obviously dispute resolution and, and at the RTA and QCAT, but if it's a body corporate dispute situation, then it's going through your self-resolution dispute service at the body corporate commissioner's office and the adjudication at the body corporate. That's right. So yes. totally separate that side of things as well. Um, there's a few questions coming through about the bulk electricity billing in a body corporate. Christine, I'm going to give that to you. Okay, so um, as everyone will know, the Normally electricity or any utility service is the responsibility of the user to set up and pay for. However, body corporate can supply the service as long as they have the agreement of the user to um, be, for the user to be charged and reimburse the body corporate for that cost. Okay. Um, so another one's coming in. If the tenant continues to breach the bylaws, even though you've issued a breach notice, what can you do? Um, well, coming back to your the tenant side of things, that would be repeated breaches. So there's a part of our legislation that talks about if the tenant breaches the same breach, 
um, for the same event or same situation in the 12 month period on the third occasion you can actually go directly off to the tribunal which is QCAT and seek uh, a termination on order on the grounds of repeated breaches. Um, but keep in mind that again is under that sort of process. I don't think the body corporate have anything like repeated contravention no, notices. No, they only have like to that. send one. Um, if it's not remedied then they can pursue it through conciliation or they can go to the magistrate's court for a penalty to be imposed. I've just seen one question. To access the online training, go to qld.gov.au forward slash body corporate training. Okay, fantastic. Um, I am conscious of time. I think we're sort of like very close to our time. Um, one of the other questions up there we have, <coughs> excuse me, with signage, do we need the committee approval as well as the on-site manager? On-site manager does not have any authority in a body corporate situation, so you always need committee or general meeting decisions subject to what your bylaw says. Okay, and just a quick one just coming through because the list of questions is quite large. How do I amend the bylaws for air conditioning? And now I'm not sure whether that's, that's actually adding an air conditioning unit or... If it's amending an existing bylaw, it's the process we discussed earlier about a general meeting decision by special resolution to amend the community management statement, which is ultimately going to amend that bylaw. Okay, great. Well, we do have still a lot of questions there, and I'm sorry that we cannot answer everybody's questions. There's questions on smoking, car park visitors, uh, cars and car parks um, for, uh, delegated for visitors. We will try and see what, uh, if we can actually deal directly with some of these questions um, and I do really appreciate your time. It's just unfortunately we uh, have a lot of questions that we just can't get to. So I'd like to sort of like go back to Christine and say thank you so much for coming in and joining us this morning. Thank you. What we might need to do is maybe another webinar and maybe just deal with a lot, a lot of, of all questions. just the um, questions that we have coming through, which is yeah. obviously a lot. Happy to do that. Um, we will actually have a copy of this webinar available on our website probably just in the next week or so. Um, it will be available. So please, uh, those people who are asking for a copy of our slides or anything like that, a copy of the actual webinar will be available and as I said we will try and see if we can get to some of the um, questions that have been submitted as well. If not we might run a second webinar and just deal with all the questions that's coming in yes. if that's all right. Christine, that's fine. you're welcome to come back and join us again. Happy to do so. Great. Thank you everybody for your attendance. Um, the webinar will end now. We do have a uh, survey that will pop up shortly on your screen. We'd love for you to um, complete it. It gives, us a, uh, gives you an opportunity to tell us about any topics that you would like to know more about. So thank you everybody for joining us today.